First of all, how are you doing? Not too bad for 8 a.m. I'm not a super morning person, so believe it or not, for me, 8 is like early. <laughs> a bit of a night owl, but um, yeah, good. I'm good, man. Me too. Yeah, I, uh, I don't like to get up before 8. But yeah, so if you guys don't know Sean, he's probably one of the best copywriting coaches out there that actually has like really high success rates for his students been following him for probably one to two years just kind of watching seeing what's going on so super pumped to have him on hey this is troy erickson from the secrets of scale podcast and the email secrets inner circle today i have a very special guest with me especially if you follow me for copywriting or email marketing purposes because this guy is very similar and he's probably one of the best gurus in the industry in terms of success rates for his students i've been following him for the last one to two years I would consider myself a, a fan, actually, and um, I don't say that about too many people. So I'm super excited to have Sean Ferris here with us today, all the way from Australia. Dude, it's good to be here. And likewise as well, man, I've been following your work for probably once or two years now as well. And um, yeah, very impressed with what you've been up to, man. So it's cool to finally hang out in person and, and chat. Absolutely. Thank you for being here. So I always like to ask the very first question anytime I talk to somebody how the heck did you get into this whole copywriting space? <laughs> yeah, it's always, everyone always has some sort of weird twisted way they got in here. I don't think anyone grows up and says, Hey mom, you know, when I get older, like I want to be a copywriter. Right? No, it was actually totally by accident, man. So my main like um, career aspiration vision, like still is music, right? So I'm a DJ, I'm a music producer. I make dance music. All that's finally like sort of starting to pop off now this year, but when I first started, dude, I was studying mechanical engineering straight after high school. I did super well in high school, went into engineering. I was like, cool, I'm going to like build Ferraris or something. It's going to be fun. After a year of that, uh, I was like, oh, this is not really what I want to do with my life. Not because it's too hard. I just kind of realized probably like you, like I've always had that entrepreneurial spirit and knew I would never like end up working for someone else. And I kind of looked at like where this, you know, university or, you know, college path was taking me. And I was like, this is taking me straight down the path. Like I don't want to go down. And I was like, Hmm, I should probably do something. So I completely dropped out and started producing music, did a full 180. My parents were not super thrilled with that as you can imagine. And yeah, and then obviously like sort of what goes along with being a, an artist, you know, in the beginning days is not a lot of money. Right. So like, I didn't want to be like the broke struggling musician for ages. And so then I was like, well, I need some sort of like really high paying side hustle so I can just work the minimum amount of time humanly possible and make enough to sustain myself. Like, I don't know if I can make a like hundred grand a year, that'd be amazing. And then um, I could just like do music full time. That'd be, that was my goal. And then, so I tried <laughs> literally everything from, Oh dude, I was the biggest like shiny object syndrome kid. I was like everything from like Forex trading, drop shipping, network marketing, online casino hacking, sports betting, just you name it. Like I tried it. It was like six or seven different things that I would just like jump from one to the next to the next to the next. All of them didn't work. And then finally I came to my senses and I was like, maybe instead of trying to do this by myself, why don't I hire someone who's like already been here and done that and can just show me what to do. And so around that time, Jason Capital, who I believe you're familiar with as well, was putting out his first email copywriting program. So it's called, I think it was Email Income Experts. That's what it was called back in the day. It was probably five years ago. And um, I was like, this sounds cool. This copywriting thing sounds pretty legit. And uh, I jumped in. So I basically gave him all the money I had, which is not a lot. It was like three and a half grand at the time. Um, and yeah, I just jumped straight in, man. All, all my savings from working at a warehouse for like a year. And I found it pretty easy to get clients. For whatever reason, I just seem to have a natural knack for copywriting. Um, Sam Robson, if you know him, and Tyler Ryan. Sam at the time was actually marking like the homework and assignments for the program. And he was like, dude, Sean, like your emails are like really good. They're like top, I don't know, top three out of like 500 people. And I was like, oh, okay. I didn't think they were that special. I mean, I still worked hard and practiced and everything, but I guess I was naturally pretty good. And I found it really easy to get clients after the program. Like I would just reach out to them, talk to them like a person, you know, close them. And then like everyone else in the program was just fucking like mind blown. Like they could not get a client to save their life. And they were like, dude, Sean, how are you doing this? How are you getting people to pay you for this? Like, how are you getting clients? And I was like, just stop talking to them like a, you know, canned like script, like a robot. Talk to them like a fucking person. And they were like, oh, right. So I just kind of showed everyone what I was doing. And, and then they started getting clients and I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And I kind of just really enjoyed that process of helping someone on a deep, like intimate one-to-one -one level more than I actually enjoyed the copywriting work. Cause I guess I was good at it. I just didn't really enjoy 
copywriting that much. And so then that's when I transitioned into, uh, eventually transitioned into coaching full-time. And then, um, yeah, that was about a bit over three years ago. And it's kind of blown up way more than I ever thought it would since. It was supposed to be my little side hustle. And um, during the pandemic, it like three or four X into basically seven figure business. And so now I'm kind of juggling that with the music kind of feels like I'm working two full-time jobs, but yeah, that's essentially uh, how I got to where I am today and how I got into this crazy world. Awesome. Yeah, it is really funny. Every person I talk to is like, dude, like I have this crazy story <laughs> and everybody's is so unique and different. And I kind of honestly want to like take this whole podcast and make it about freedom because I also like am a musician. I play guitar. I'm probably not as good as you. I know you don't play guitar, but maybe you do. I don't know. Um, I don't, okay. I play nothing. I'm probably not as good as you. Violin. Musically. <laughs> but it's something I really enjoy. It's something I'm passionate about. I go to a lot of Metallica concerts. Like that's my jam and I love it. But I don't really have like the time to figure out like, okay, how do I do email, copywriting, list management, and also coach people? And then also like play music on the side. Because when I started out, like in my life, baseball was my first passion. And then now it kind of like shifted into music and business. And business just, it takes up the majority of my time. So how do you balance two passions as well? That is a good question. And I'm not sure I have the answers. <laughs> I guess I'm, what I've been doing is slowly getting me there. But I guess what works for me is kind of just splitting up the day. So I like to do during the day, work on my business and then. I usually go to gym at like four ish PM. And then when I get back from there, that's kind of like, you know, I eat dinner and then that's like the start of my second work day, I guess. So like at nighttime then I just work on music and then usually on the weekends, if I'm not doing anything, then I work on music too. So I guess that's kind of like just what works for me. I'm just really like, I'm more creative at night and I guess more linear thinking during the day. So that just, it's kind of what works for me, but it's basically just like, yeah, just work all day. And it's kind of like two work days, essentially. It's like two shorter, separate work days. But yeah, definitely. It wasn't easy. That's the thing. Like most people, like similar situations, like, you know, this is my main passion, but I just want to do this copywriting thing as like a side hustle. And I tell them all the time, I was like, you can't really grow. I'm going to say, I don't want to say you can't do anything, but it's really challenging to grow two different things at the same time. So like what I did when I was growing the email copywriting thing and then the coaching business, I was like, music pretty much just took a back seat for like six months or a year. Like I barely worked on it at all. I was like, let me get this business thing set up. Let me get it running. And then I can start outsourcing bits and pieces and get my time back once the cash flow is coming in. And then I can like shift my focus back to music. But if you're trying to fully grow two things at the same time, I think that's, once you're Elon Musk and just fucking just, you know, you want to work like 16, 20 hours a day, then I just think it's too difficult to do that. Yeah, it's really hard. And there's people that are like, man, I want to start like two or three businesses. And I'm like, how can you even think? <laughs> Don't. It, it's, it's, <laughs> Don't after, you know, when you get to the seven figure point, it's like, sure, you have a lot of things figured out. And then maybe you could be like, okay, well, during the morning, I'm going to work. And then like mid afternoon, I'm going to work out. And then at the end of the day, I'm going to do something I enjoy. It's really hard to get to that point. You're right. It's like, you kind of have to focus on one thing until it's at a certain point. For a lot of people listening, maybe you're just at the point where like, you know what? I just want a few clients. I just want to make a certain amount. I don't want to grow this big, crazy business, but I have this issue where I do want to grow the big crazy business and just I'm so passionate about it. It, it. It's hard to to find time for all that stuff. But for somebody who let's say they just want to make 10, 15, 20k a month and then just do whatever else they enjoy, what are some of those client getting strategies that you teach that they could implement right away and try to get to that point and then do what they really enjoy? Yeah, it's a good question. I have a lot of actually like free stuff on my YouTube when it comes to getting clients. I just like, I pretty much just like give all my best shit away on, on YouTube. But I mean, yeah, there's really like two main platforms that I really like. So a lot of people like shit on cold emails and um, to a certain extent, I can understand why, because most cold emails like suck. But if you go about it the right way, cold emails can actually really crush. They can do really well. So there's those. And I'm a big fan of Instagram. Like a lot of people um, like Facebook or, or LinkedIn. I've always just found Instagram to be the, the best platform to grow a business on in my perspective. So I like to grow that because it's it's kind of like a home base, so to speak, where clients can, I guess, check you out. It's almost like a mini website, if you think about it. It's pretty rare to have a platform that's like, it's like a website, a, a messaging service, and also like a, you know, put out content kind of thing. All like, it's like a three in one, which I think is pretty cool. So if you go about it the right way and you have your bio set up right, you have decent content, then 
like a lot of people, you know, use Instagram or something and they reach out to clients and they're like, oh, I'm not getting any results. And it's like, well, look at your profile, dude. Like it's, um, you know, you have like three pictures of you and your dog and like a picture of an acai bowl and wondering like why you can't get clients. It's like, you got to set it up right. But yeah, mainly cold email and Instagram are the two ways that I like to go about getting clients. And there's a whole variety of like, you know, if you want to talk scripts and all that kind of stuff, like I have uh, my free cheat sheet, um, the clients on command DM, the script's all in there that I like to use, but really like you can be boiled down pretty simply to, it's kind of a combination of two things. It's basically like in-group bias and then leading with value or leading with a giving hand. So I think the number one reason that most cold outreach pitches doesn't really matter what platform you're using, like don't work is because you're a total stranger and they have no reason to know you or trust you or give you the time of day to bother replying. So if you can in any way, shape, form whatsoever, establish some sort of like in-group bias whether it's you have any mutual connections in common, any interests in common, maybe you both like the same weird band or food or taste of music or something. Just anything that shows them that you're really part of like the same circles, which really comes down to you taking like 60 seconds, doing a little bit of research, looking at their profile, just finding something, anything that you guys like have in common that's a little bit unique. And then like just mentioning that, especially the mutual friend thing, that's super powerful. So if you've even just heard someone say good things about them, Then you can just like on a podcast, on an Instagram story, then just mention that. And immediately it's like you skip this, it's like this barrier here. It's like a bouncer at the wall. And you immediately just like, boop, you just jump the fucking velvet rope and just go straight into like the, oh, I know this guy, I should probably pay attention and um, reply to him kind of like category as opposed to the instantly delete his message category. Um, And yeah, and then leading with a giving hand as well. So meaning just like give them value upfront, aka like two or three free samples that they can test. So they can see your work firsthand rather than you blabbing on about how good you are. Like show them. Yeah. I'm actually happy you brought up cold email because that's something that I haven't done a lot of. But we recently, in the email sequence in our circle, we recently had a training with Andrew Hanekavich on how to do like mass cold email, which was amazing. It blew my mind. You're talking about how to do more personal cold emails, which I haven't done cold, but I've used the same strategy on like Facebook Messenger when I started out, giving people videos, value relating to them, showing like, hey, I'm a human, not a really thirsty kid in need of clients. And then yep. there's also Instagram. And for you, I think it works better because your audience is people who want more clients. My audience as of now is more like businessy people. So it goes to show that like anything works. You just have to have the right message to the right person and use a lot of the things that you just talked about. So if anybody has questions on that, Sean's YouTube is great. And I have some trainings on that as well. So that's cool. Now, going back into the whole why of this, it's like you're wanting to play music. Are you wanting to do that professionally? Is it more of a hobby right now? Like what is your your biggest goal outside of business? Oh, yeah, for sure. That's like my ultimate like career aspiration. Like, you know, I want to play fucking Tomorrowland, Ultra Music Festival, like all that stuff. And there's things starting to make progress towards there now. It's not official, but I might be playing like Croatia, Ultra Croatia, Boat Party. Maybe Ultra Japan in a very like small, like warm up slot side stage um, or whatever, but it's still, it's like you're on the flyer, you're on the flyer. So it's good enough. And yeah, and yeah, that's for sure my, my main aspiration. Like I have a track coming out tomorrow, actually, um, with Fat Man Scoop, which is pretty cool on Spinning Records. It's my second release on Spinning. And yeah, there's so much new stuff coming out this year, but that's, that's still, that's still my main goal yeah, for sure. So just, yeah. so, just so people know. How big are you in music compared to how big you are coaching how to get copy clients? It's hard to tell. <laughs> I don't really know. I mean, I guess I have like, what, 300,000 monthly listens on Spotify. I actually just hit 10 million streams yesterday, which is, I think is pretty cool. Congrats. Um, on Spotify, like all time, which is cool. So, and most of them were self-release tracks as well. I mean, I, I started like with, I don't know if you've heard them. I did tracks with like Jason Capital, Elliot Hulse. Bedros Koulian, Joel Brown. They're kind of like this gym workout motivational anthem kind of tracks. And then it's really started popping off on Spotify because like they just got added to all these gym playlists. Yeah. And then I suppose I leveraged the streams that I was getting from that to then eventually get record deals with like spinning or like other bigger labels. And so it's kind of just laying one brick at a time, you know? So this year is going to really like explode shit, but it's really like the last fucking what five years that I've um, put in that have like you know, it's like everyone's like, oh, overnight success, but it's like a five fucking six year, seven year overnight success. You know, it's laying the foundations for long enough, sort of under the surface that no one really sees till eventually it's kind of visible to the public. And then it just appears like you've just come from nowhere kind of thing. But um, 
Yeah, definitely. So long story short, yeah, music is, is still like the big aspiration. That's awesome. I had no idea that you were that big and you have like 10 million listens. That's pretty cool. And to your point, I kind of view success as like, you ever seen one of those pictures where it's like a mountain peak and there's like a giant cloud and you can't see anything of the mountain except for the peak? It's like you're, yeah, you like could the, be climbing the a mountain iceberg for years. analogy as well. You could be climbing a mountain for years and people don't see you until you're at the top. So that's something they keep in mind for a lot of people too. Now, an interesting question, how much of the copy skills that you've built up over the years have helped you get yourself out there in music? Yeah, dude, that's interesting. I definitely use it like all the time, whenever I can. It's like, it's a pretty good hack. Cause I mean, there's times where I've had to send my demos to actually, to be honest, that's probably how I got on spinning is using like my copy skills because what happened, how I first managed to get on. So for everyone listening, basically spinning records is like the biggest dance music label in the world. They're owned by Warner. And how I managed to get on there was actually collaborating with someone else who had already been on there. So I made a track completely. It was like hundred percent finished, polished, the best fucking track I could possibly make. I sent it to this guy, Luca Testa. He's this Italian, like hard style DJ. And I didn't even want to collaborate. I just wanted feedback. And so I used literally like the exact same principles in the client so command DM, like cheat sheet that I have in terms of like creating the in-group bias, leading with value, splitting up the messages. So it wasn't like one long fucking paragraph and really just like, yeah, all like the copy persuasion kind of skills that I know to make it like low key. And um, the in-group bias thing is so powerful, man. It's like, I can't tell you how many times that I've, I've sent like a, a demo track to like some big DJ hasn't responded to me. And then like a year later, I've been like, dude, this guy recommended that I send the track over. Like, you know, this guy who you know, and who I know, who's also like some big ish DJ or whatever recommended that he thought you would like it. So I wanted to send it over. And it's like, they fucking drop what they're doing on Friday night, respond within 60 seconds. It's like night and day difference. It's crazy. So yeah. And then yeah, basically messaged him and then he really liked the track and he wanted to collaborate on it. And yeah. And then because obviously he had connections with spinning, that's how that ended up happening. And then this one tomorrow is going to be my first solo release on spinning, which is fun. Yeah. I forgot what your original question was. Um, but yeah, definitely like it's helped me so many times in like copy skills, persuasion, knowing just human psychology really. And it's not so much, it's not like I'm writing this fucking guy's a sales letter, you know what I mean? But it's like knowing human psychology of what these people respond to, knowing just what makes people tick and what makes them more likely to respond, you know, and the whole cold outreach thing. And so it's helped me, dude, it's helped me get like free protein powder, you know, just like free stuff, demos, record deals, like it's applicable to like everything, which is what I love about it. So yeah, that's awesome. I mean, I can definitely attest to that. Just like I just walk around outside around what I call like normal people because I'm crazy. <laughs> and I feel like I can read people's minds now that I'm good at copy. And just understanding like what motivates people and like why should they respond? It's like what's in it for them? Exactly. That's awesome to hear how it's helping. Yeah, it's always it's always a good um guiding light is to kind of keep keep in mind, I call it W I I F M radio. <laughs> It's like, what's in it for me, right? Like, why should they care? Why should they respond? A lot of people are just like, they're reaching out and they're just like wanting to take, you know, it's like wanting for their own benefit, but it's like, you got to look at it. You got to put yourself in their shoes and be like, if you were them, would you respond to this? If so, like, why, why not? You know, and then craft it so that it's actually in their best interest and in some way serves them or benefits them to actually give you the time of day. That's good. Now, this is a bit of a selfish question I'm going to ask on behalf of myself. Um, but you seem like, let me ask you this really quickly. Are you a believer in like mental coaching and like mindset and all that? I suppose, I don't know, it's hard for me to say. Because I know back in the day, like when I first got, how I first got into this world, probably like a lot of other people is kind of started along the personal development path. And then I think back then, I think Jason Capital, he just transitioned out of his like dating coaching more into the personal development coaching and then into eventually like business and copywriting. And I don't know what the fuck he's doing now. He changes like every year. What he's doing, But yeah, definitely, man. Like I think back in the day, I literally would invest everything. Like I probably Jason, I just gave Jason capital all my fucking money. Like everything he put out, I was like, but, <laughs> um, and he's definitely helped me a ton. Like in terms of like kind of screwing my head on straight, my beliefs, my mindsets around not just like business and wealth and money and abundance, but like, really just like teaching me sort of how to think in a way that is like, I don't know, that's success mindset or whatever. So I definitely can't discredit that and can't discount that because that's that's definitely helped me a lot. And that's something I probably forget about because it was like 10 years ago. But yeah, I think, dude, I think, I think mindset is super important. I mean, a lot of people like 
shit on it. And a lot of people think like, oh, you know, fuck the mindset stuff. Like, just give me the tactics, give me the strategies. And it's like, I give you all the tactics and strategies in the world. But it's like, if you don't have like the right mindset mentality, like they're not going to work for you. You know what I mean? You're going to find a way to shoot yourself in the foot, self-sabotage. Like you'll just find a way to fuck it up if, if you don't have like the right mentality about it. So super important. Yeah. So the reason I asked that that leads into the selfish question is so last week I had Lauren Tickner. Today I have you. You're both very successful coaches. Now for me, I started out in the agency route and I have an agency. We have like 20 something clients on roster right now, but I hadn't dipped my toes enough into the coaching side of things. Like I have a group of like 500 students, but I haven't really dove into it. It's just grown organically. And I think the reason is because online, I hear a lot of people talking about coaches who don't like still practice what they teach. And that's something that's like stopped me from going and coaching. So do you ever get people saying that to you? Like, hey, why don't you write for a bunch of clients or have an agency? And like, how do you overcome that? Because most of the time, those are just trolls. Yeah, for sure. Dude, I was talking to, I did a similar thing to this last week with Nick Verge, if you know him. And um, yeah, we are talking about exactly the same thing. Like a lot of people love to like, poo poo on um coaches and stuff like that but yeah i mean like as he said it was like if you have a gift or talent or whatever or skill in helping other people get results like there's nothing wrong with that at all i think i mean yeah to be honest like if copywriting was my full-time thing like if i didn't have music then yeah i probably would i'd still be writing for my clients and also coaching other people on how to get clients i guess similar to like you know stefan georgie justin goff like they're still regularly write sales letters and stuff for other people for 50 grand, hundred grand whilst also coaching. And like, yeah, if I was, if music wasn't a thing, then I would probably still be doing that as well. Like I would still have copy clients and practicing what I preach and also helping other people to get clients. But the reality of it is like, I can't really balance like three. I just wouldn't have time. It's, it's really a time constraint thing. It's like to grow like a music career while also like coaching business while also writing copy for other people. It's like even balancing two things is like hard enough. So adding like a, a third one and still writing copy for all these people, I think would definitely take away from my success of the other two things. And I think all three of them would just sort of slowly decline. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I hear you. I think it's just a matter of saying like, and I don't really care what people are saying. Cause it's like, I have one life and I can probably do two things, not three. So I'm going to stick with the two all the most. And I probably going to do more of that myself. Um, what I think would be really cool though is at some point selling the agency at like, I don't know, two, three X multiple, taking the cash and then just continuing to coach and being like, hey guys, yeah, I did it and I successfully exited. So I think I should make that Michael. But we'll see what happens. Kimberly is pretty fucking good at what you do when it comes to email marketing. Obviously, like if I think of email deliverability, my mind's been like Troy Erickson. Everyone who asks me, it's like, oh dude, I'm having trouble, like hitting promo. You know, like, what should I do? How should I fix my deliverability? I'm just like, Troy, like, Troy's your guy. Like, just go to him. He'll fix you. I think, yeah, you've done a really good job sort of carving out yourself that space in the niche. You know what I mean? It's like you and Joel Marion are kind of the two people that I think of when it comes to deliverability. And so whatever you've done, uh, it seems to be working really well. So I would just, I'll just continue that for now. And um, yeah, I mean, if you have the capacity to coach as well, you clearly like have the results. You're very good at what you do. So I don't see any problem with, um, with that at all. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, it, it, you know, it's reassuring. And it's really cool too. I mean, are you in any masterminds or anything? Or like, how did you meet all the people that you know? Because obviously you name dropped several big names, not just Jason Capital, but like Bedros and a lot of people who are at the very top of the industry. Like, how did you meet all of them? Yeah, so I mean, like Bedros, Elliot Holtz, those kind of people. I just met at live events, like Jason's, um, what is it called, High Status Summits or whatever, over the last like four or five years. So they were the speakers at the events and, you know, sometimes like in the hallway or whatever, you know, that you get a chance to chat to them. And then, yeah, that's how I kind of connected with those people. And yeah, I definitely, I was in Taki, if you know Taki more, I was in his mastermind for about a year. Oh man. Yeah. He definitely like Taki super legit. Like he helped me go from six to seven figures and I only left actually, because I wasn't really using half the stuff. I was kind of like, I way exceeded the original goal that I had. And I just kind of want to maintain where I'm at and like just focus on music so it's like if i wanted to keep growing and scaling i mean there's people in his mastermind doing fucking 50 mil or more a year like a million a week it's crazy so if, if that was just like my my goal my ambition i was like i want to scale this thing to the moon then yeah i'd probably still be in there for sure yeah once again i think i'm in just a bit of a unique position where i'm kind of just like 
music's my main focus. So I, I, yeah. yeah, I do. I nearly got caught in that trap actually. Cause it's like, it's very, you know, once you start making like seriously, like decent money online, it's very like addictive. You kind of just like, holy shit, like how far can I take this? Do you know what I mean? And so I actually joined like his upper level mastermind at one point, which was designed to take you from like seven to eight figures. And there's all these like fucking massive, like ballers in there. Like I went from like the big fish in a small pond to like a tiny fish in a massive pond. I was like, holy shit, look at all. I was people are doing like millions a month, you know? And I was like, whoa, this is cool. And so, yeah, I kind of just left it after a couple of weeks. I had to realize like, dude, what are you doing? Like, I mean, your original goal was like music. So I had to like shift my focus back to that. Because yeah, it was very tempting. It was very tempting for a little while to just like. Yeah, the biggest thing I've learned from this, just listening (laughs) to you is like how well you balance those two things. Because for some reason, my brain is like, when I get on something, I can't get enough of it. And with the, like, I just joined a hundred million mastermind recently. Next event is coming up this weekend. And I'm super pumped. But like masterminds, dude, it's like, you can achieve so much by like creating that network and just like leveling up, leveling up, leveling up. But there's other yeah. things that I want to do in my life and it's just so hard to balance. So I'm happy that you've got that figured out. It's pretty inspirational for me. Not going to lie. Dude. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't stress like enough the benefits that come from masterminds more so than the stuff you learn is like at those live events the people that you meet and like dude i've gotten more value and like golden nuggets and success in my business from the chats you have with people like in the breaks like at dinner at the bar afterwards when you're all kind of like you know getting on the drinks yeah that's that's really where the value comes from for me and that's probably one of the reasons I left as well. Cause during the pandemic, there were no more live events anymore. And I was like, oh. that's really where I had like all the juice. Like even just like one thing, there's some girl that I met there, Jamie. And she talks about this government grant where if you run a business and most of your clients are overseas, because you're bringing all this money into Australia, the government will literally like refund up to half your marketing costs. So like half my Facebook ads, they will like refund because I'm bringing you know, like what a million a year into Australia from overseas that wasn't there before. And so they're like happy to, you know, they gave me like 50 grand last year. This year will probably be like 110 grand. Um, and I was like, that's fucking crazy. I would have no idea about that if it wasn't at this mastermind, like talking to this sitting next to this one girl at dinner, you know, who just casually mentioned it as like an aside. Yeah. So big fan, big fan of masterminds. Yeah, for sure. I love events. Love events are huge. Yeah, the side note, I was talking, I was at a mastermind recently and Mike Phil Same was like, Hey, did you know that? Google will give you a grant if you have a nonprofit business, which you can use to educate people and then sell things. If you set up that business, Google will give you 10 grand a month of free advertising. And you can get like 10 of those grants, which is like 1.2 mil a year in free ads if you use all of them. Like, but little hacks like that, yeah, like masterminds yeah. are nuts. And it's not just like super advanced tax stuff. It's, I mean, there's all kinds of things. Like my girlfriend's like kind of new in business. And every time she goes, there's like new stuff. So anybody who's not in the mastermind group, just try it once and it'll probably change a lot of things for you. Now, a fun question that I always like to ask towards the end is actually two questions. The, the second one will make you laugh, I promise. But the first one, what is the best business idea that you've ever had? Whether it's like a strategy or like an actual business idea. Yeah, um, that's, a, that's an interesting one. It's probably something I know. I I just went on this whole thing about how you shouldn't have like three businesses, um, but I'm actually starting a new one at the moment with my friend Demo. He came to me one day. It was like um, some after party. We were both like super lit after some event, and he's telling me about what he's what he's been able to set up in his home his hometown in Canberra. It's fucking crazy. He made like 700k in a year in his first year in one like small town, basically doing gutter guard installation. So. It's sorry, it's not. Um, so basically, what he does so gutter guards are like little mesh strips that go in your gutters to stop leaves falling in and that kind of stuff. And the whole thing is like fully automated by VAs, right? So it's on this platform called OneFlare, which is kind of like Airtasker, High Pages. It's like um, Airbnb for tradies, I suppose, for getting like um, tradesmen, right? And um, there's a VA run the entire thing. It's like nuts. So as soon as a job is posted, the VA quotes on it. Then um, the VA calls them. And what most people need to do, right, is go to their house, inspect it in person, measure up the gutter, give them a quote. And then like, you know, then they can move forward. The VA literally like on the call right there and then zooms in on the house on Google Maps. You can actually, I didn't know this, you can measure distances of Google Maps. It measures the whole perimeter of the house. It's like, okay, cool. It's hundred meters. That'll be $3,000. 
And they go, cool, sounds good. And then he will hire a subcontractor to go install the gutter guard. He'll pay him 1500 or two grand. And then he pockets a grand for doing like literally nothing. And he just has this running like at scale. And the VAs run the whole thing. He literally has like nothing and made like 700K in one tiny city in a year. And I was like, oh. And um, yeah, so now we're starting our own version of that, except instead of gutter guards, it's DJs for weddings. Because I actually used to be a wedding DJ as well. So I know the industry pretty well, but rather than getting paid like 27 bucks an hour or something, I only found out afterwards, like, dude, I was playing for like 26, 27 an hour. And my boss was charging like 150 an hour. And I was like, shit, I want to be on that end of the uh, the spectrum. Yeah. So we're doing like a similar thing. And basically it's just going to be Australia wide off the bat. We're going to hire other DJs to do the work, pay them like 70 to hundred an hour, and then basically pocket like 50 an hour or something for doing nothing. But except we have like multiple events going at the same time. So yeah, that's cool. Because I'm excited for that. I'm excited for it, that. It lines up with something that you've done before that you're interested in. It doesn't take a lot of time. So it's like somewhat passive. And as you make more and more money throughout your career, it's like those opportunities come up where you're more of like an investor um, and more passive. So that's cool to hear that you're like supplementing everything else you do to make more without adding a ton of extra time. Now, yeah, the VAs like run the whole thing. It's crazy. The flip side to that question, what's the worst business idea you've ever thought of? Where do I start? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's probably, it would have been one of the things back in the day before I actually came to my senses, hired a mentor and then like, you know, got into the copywriting stuff. I mean, there were just so many like failed businesses. Actually, the way I got into it was sports betting. So I started betting on the Australian Open um, the tennis tournament and I bet five bucks on this guy who was against the world number one. It was like David versus Goliath. It was like super unheard of. The odds were way, it was like 30 to one. And it was against Murray, who was the world number one at the time. I was like, ah, fuck it. I'll throw five bucks on him just in case. And they ended up beating Murray. Like it was a massive upset. So I turned five bucks into like, I don't know, 150, 200. I was like, whoa, I'm a fucking genius. And I was like, because I actually got fired from my job at that point. This is my only source of income for like a month. I was just blindly betting on tennis players. And um, I just got lucky, to be honest. At the time, I probably thought I was a genius, but I was like, basically just getting lucky. And that that made me enough to survive for like a month, which is pretty cool. But yeah, I mean, dude, I, I, a whole bunch of shit. Probably like getting into network marketing. It's probably like a big... <laughs> it's a pretty Not good a fan <laughs> Not a fan of that at all. Very similar. I've heard a lot of smart people actually talk about like, crypto and they're like all right i'm gonna take a bunch of like tiny probably crappy coins and invest a little bit in all of them and one of them will boom if the rest fail so kind of like the crypto version of that it's it's pretty funny thank you for sharing that sean if somebody wants to learn more about you learn more about music or copywriting where should they go yeah so probably the best place is either facebook or instagram so sean ferris s-e-a-n f-e-r-r-e-s at sean ferris that's my instagram for business if you want to chat music stuff, the inbox I probably check more often, to be honest, is my music one. So it's Big Moo Music, B-I-G-M-O-O Music. And that's, yeah, an inbox I check a lot more. Like the Sean Ferris one, we have so many ads running and like I sometimes miss stuff, but the music one, I'm probably more likely to see it. Yeah. So Facebook or Instagram, man, are the two best places. Right. Another funny last second note here is Nate Pierce just commented. He said he just realized that your song Fuck Normal is by you. And he's been listening to it during his workouts for a long time. Yeah, that's the one I did with Jason Capital. That was probably the first song I've made that actually got decent like traction on Spotify. It just hit like 2 million streams the other day or something, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for joining. And thank you for going much outside the realm of business because that's where like the real connections are made. So again, you can find Sean on Instagram or Facebook. You'll probably have a better chance at contacting him on the music page, Big Moo Music. So feel free to reach out because he can help you with everything that we've talked about today. So thank you everyone for watching. If you want to tune in live or share this with somebody else for the next episode, the SOSpodcast.com is how you can do that. So I'll see you guys next week.